Hi, I'm Sam. Welcome and thanks for watching. Uh, this presentation covers some graph theory basics as part of a series on network analysis. To introduce this subject, I've chosen two quotes, one from Ian McCullough in 2013 and one from Dennis Koenig in 1936. This period of time covers the development of the Turing machine to the release of the iPhone 5S. These two events being the development of the first ever computer to the release of a widely adopted individual computational communications product. I see this as a span from an arcane concept to normalized use and dependence on technology founded by an idea essentially in 1670 and a paper published in 1736. I think it's important to introduce the applications of the concepts up front because if you can see the forest for the trees then you don't get lost in the part level and you can see the emergent properties and the interdependent parts. Secondly, the quote from Dennis Koenig really delimits the scope of graph theory to combinatorics and set theory, which has helped me focus this presentation, but also attempt to standardize terminology. Ian McCullough's work really helped me understand network theory and social network analysis. He states in his 2013 book, Social Network Analysis with Applications, that as a maturing area of inquiry, the field of networks has expanded from a somewhat arcane branch of mathematics, i.e. graph theory, and a relatively focused structural approach in the social sciences, i.e. sociometry and its descendants, uh, to a powerful perspective for studying relational systems quite generally. I like the term arcane to describe early graph theory because even the microbiology concepts that Louis Pasteur developed in the 1870s were once considered arcane as well. And we see the globally accepted and commonly known fact that microbes, ex microbes exist today. Moving on to Dennis Koenig, who in 1936 is credited as writing the first ever book on graph theory, the Theory of Finite and Infinite Graphs. Koenig is the right shoulder of a book that studies the evolution of graph theory, which was written by Biggs et al. in 1998. As we move on to the examples, uh, you can see the two network diagrams on the left. Uh, one from McCullough and Carley's 2008 paper, Social Network Change Detection, in which they show the Al-Qaeda communications network, and the other is a network of causal factors from McGlashan's 2016 paper titled Quantifying a Systems Map, Network Analysis of a Childhood Obesity Causal Loop Diagram. These two network diagrams are good contemporary examples of the applications of graph theory. Moving on to the illustrations on the right, they show Dennis Koenig as Mr. K pointing to three diagrams. The top, di top is a diagram of two disjoint sets A and B within the universal set where the intersection of A and B is the empty set, therefore showing that the two sets are disjoint. The second on the left is a diagram of the possible combinations of three elements where two are chosen without repetition of the elements using the n-choose-k equation. The diagram on the right is an example of the disjoint vertex and edge sets in a graph uh, and the fact that cardinality of the edge set or the size of a graph can be found using the n choose k equation for a simple complete graph with three vertices and three edges. We'll cover more about complete simple graphs and the other types of graphs further in this presentation. The purpose of this presentation is to introduce graph theory through comparison of several texts for both consistency and context. This will give you a general idea of the concepts and variation in terminology that exists. As Wilson states in his 1996 book titled Introduction to Graph Theory, the language of graph theory is not standard and all authors have their own terminology. By consulting widely we can establish a firm foundational understanding of graph theory. This foundation enables subsequent analyses of applications in whichever discipline or circumstance you require. My aim is to establish a firm foundation through a wide consultation of available texts to understand the basic principles of graph theory concepts. This will enable us to understand the complicated terms and concepts in network theory and also its applications such as the Al-Qaeda communications network that we covered before. Once the foundation is set, we can then move on to more and more complicated terms and concepts which will then build towards our final goal. Throughout this presentation, we will cover the following. The consulted references that I use to develop this presentation and standardize some terminology where variation of terminology occurred. Then we'll cover part one, this presentation, the basics of graph theory. Part one is broken down into three parts as follows. 
In part 1.1, we'll cover what a graph is and what it is not. In part 1.2, we'll cover what the components of a graph are. And then in part 1.3, finally we'll cover a rationalization of endpoints that I've developed to explain the limitations of applications of certain concepts. On this page you'll notice that there are a lot of mathematics references, principally because graph theory is grounded in mathematics. But what I love about maths is it gives you a language to express the relationships you see every day. Essentially, it's a language of relationships. There are about 41 references that I've cited throughout this presentation, but many more that I haven't, which have helped essentially form my view of graph theory and its applications. Let's move on to part one, basics. The first of the three parts of this presentation is part 1.1, what is a graph? What a graph is not. Unlike other graphs you have encountered, these graphs, as Euler states in his 1736 published article, do not involve measurements nor calculations made with them, and no calculation is of any use. These graphs are unencumbered by position within Euclidean space, and as such do not exist within a coordinate system. The lengths between points are arbitrary, and the intersections between lines do not form vertices. Figure 1.1 shows some current graphs you may be thinking of when I say the word graph. There's a bar graph, and also the graph of a function f of x equals x squared. However, these aren't the graphs we're looking for. Three examples of the graphs that we're talking about are shown below Obi-Wan. Leibniz states in his letter to Christian Huygens in 1679 that, I'm not content with algebra and that it yields neither the shortest proofs nor the most beautiful constructions of geometry. Consequently, in view of this, I consider that we need yet another kind of analysis, geometric or linear, which deals directly with position, as algebra deals with magnitude. Although Euler published the first work in graph theory, I consider Leibniz to be the Rosalind Franklin of graph theory and Euler to be more like Watson and Crick. Moving on to Dennis Koenig and his 1936 work, The Theory of Finite and Infinite Graphs, he states in his book that the heuristic value of graph theory lies in the fact that its abstract concepts can be pictured by concrete spatial relations. But from a logical point of view, graph theory has nothing to do with spatial conception. These two quotes touch on the concept of graph theory being the geometry of position, which, although viewed as spatial relations when pictured, such as those below Obi-Wan on my right, uh, as spatial relations, have nothing to do with position within Euclidean space. What a graph is. Devoid of jargon, in its simplest form, a graph is a representation of elements and the connections between them, where connections between elements are governed by a rule of association. This is shown below in example 1.1.a, called graph components, where we go through the components of a graph, which can be shown by elements, as Mr. X and Mr. Y shaking hands, the connections between those elements being the connected line segment between the two points X and Y, and the rule of association, which maps the points X and Y uh, to one another. Further applications of graph theory are social network analysis or geographic dilemmas. Really any problem, as Euler states in his 1736 paper, which is a problem relating to the geometry of position. Elements and connections. Some graph theory concepts require different situations to either demonstrate their applications or rationalize concepts because not all types of graphs apply to real-world scenarios. This is most evident in the differences between the models used for geography and others in social networks. Entities called loops are useful for geographical applications but not so much for social networks given the utility of modeling a loner element can be achieved by a lack of connections, not an abundance of self-referential connections. This brings us to the definition of our first term. Terms throughout this presentation are denoted by the grey box titled terms with the respective term tile. These will be summarised at the end of each part of the presentation but also completely summarised at the end of this presentation. We'll go through the term loop in more detail later in this presentation. Figure 1 below shows the utility of loops in social networks. If we consider a network of three birds labelled A, B and C respectively, if there is a relationship between bird B and bird C, then we can denote this shown by the dotted line, but we can also denote it by a line segment connecting two points noted B and C. This is shown below in models 1 and model 2. 
It's important to note that the difference between Model 1 and Model 2 is an absence of self-referential connections in Model 1, whereas they are shown in Model 2, just to highlight the fact that this doesn't really value add to the depiction of the social network. Four examples of possible elements are shown below in example 11b. The possible elements shown in this example are people or animals, geography, probabilities, or cause and effect relationships. We'll cover off on each type of one of these elements in more detail throughout this section. Elements and connections, animals. A graph can be used to represent the relationship between the eight birds shown below. In example 11c, we see the bird flock diagram. Assume that all the birds in the flock know one another. The graph of this relationship can be represented by what is called a complete graph, where the individual birds are represented by points, and line segments that connect every bird to every other bird represent the relations that exist in the flock. A graph representing the interconnections that exist within the flock is shown below in example 11c. Note that every node in this diagram is connected to every other node by a link or if we replace the words nodes and links with points and line segments that every point is connected to every other point in the diagram by a line segment. This brings us to a key term of complete graphs. Although introduced here very tenuously, it will be explored in further detail throughout the presentations or in later presentations. In figure two, we explore the combinatorics of connections. If everyone in a society knew each other, then everyone would be completely connected. Consider a flock of eight birds shown to the right in example 11c. If all birds know each other, then the number of connections in the flock can be calculated using a combination of n elements with k choices without repetition of the elements. Since the number of birds equals the number of elements n, and there can only ever exist a handshake between two birds, then k equals 2. This is shown below in figure 2 with bird x and bird y, and a dotted line segment joining the two representing their connection. We see here that the result of the n choose k equation for a flock containing 8 birds is 28 connections if each bird knows one another. The n choose k equation for combinations without repetition of elements can be transformed into the triangle number, number formula when k equals 2 given that there can only ever exist a handshake between two birds. Therefore the number of connections in a complete graph can be calculated using only the number of elements and nothing else. Elements and Connections Geography Possibly the first and most well-known application of graph theory is Leonard Euler's use of graphs to solve the seven bridges of Konigsberg problem. This is shown below in example 11d. In this example, Euler is depicted by Mr. E pointing to the map of Konigsberg, now modern-day Kaliningrad. Euler states in his 1736 article that concerning these bridges, it was asked whether anyone could arrange a route in such a way that he would cross each bridge once and only once. It's important to note that although combinatorics had been well known at the time of the Konigsberg problem, set theory was not well established until George Cantor laid its foundations in between 1874 to 1884. Therefore, most of Euler's work to solve the Konigsberg problem relates largely to the dynamics of number sequences. He used the tools he had available, not the tools he wanted. Euler states that, a problem was recently mentioned which seemed geometrical but was so constructed that it did not require measurement of distances, nor did calculation help at all. I had no doubt that it was concerned with geometry of position, especially as its solution involved only position, and no calculation was of any use. The Konigsberg Bridge problem asks if a journey across each of the seven bridges that connect four land masses across the Pregel River can be undertaken crossing each bridge once and only once. This is shown in the animation in example 11d where the geographical disposition is formed into a mental model containing four points and seven line segments connecting each of the four points as shown. The land masses are highlighted blue with bridges represented by red points. All points are labelled alphabetically with capital letters A through D, representing the land masses, and lowercase letters representing the bridges A through G. Elements and Connections Geography continued. Rather than plough through the multiple permutations of bridge crossing sequences to work out if a journey could be made, Euler identified the underlying dynamics of journeys based on the rules of the problem. 
Firstly, he used a sequence of alternating area letters to represent a bridge crossing. Note that a single bridge crossing between areas A and B generates a journey sequence of two letters, in this instance AB. This is shown in the bridge crossing sequence below in figure 3.1. The arithmetic sequence formula is also shown below in the blue box at the bottom of figure 3.1 for reference. Uh, AN is the nth term of the sequence which is equal to the sum of the first term A1 and the product of N minus 1 and the common difference. N is the nth term of the sequence. I'll refer back to the terms of the sequence as we go through the example. Figure 3.2 shows the dynamics of multiple bridge crossings while still only using the two areas A and B. We start the journey at area A crossing bridges A through to D in an alternating sequence. The journey sequence is shown in purple as A, B, A, B, A. Note that the journey sequence for crossing four bridges has five letters. This is annotated in the animation in red. I've tried to show the journey sequence in terms of an arithmetic sequence structure to demonstrate the emergence of a pattern that is offset for odd and even numbers of the sequence. In this example, starting a journey from letter area A and crossing four bridges, we see that it takes five terms to represent the journey sequence A, B, A, B, A. Along the top of the sequence, I've shown the frequency of letter A appearing in the sequence. The purple arrows trace the appearance of letter A and the orange arrows trace the appearance of letter B. The key idea that emerges from the initial exploration of bridge crossing sequences is that the number of letter occurrences is a specific sequence and it's a function that maps the frequency of occurrence to the number of terms in the sequence as shown to the bottom right of the slide in the grey box. In the grey box with the light bulb we can see that the number of letter i occurrences in the sequence ki is a function of the term number in the sequence. We see that it varies depending on whether n is odd or even. Conversely to the previous slide, when the journey is not started from a, the frequency of a at the nth term of the sequence changes from n plus 1 on 2 to n minus 1 on 2 for odd numbered terms and stays the same for even numbered terms. This is shown below in figure 4. Note that the sequence of a journey that crosses four bridges has five terms, in this instance b a b a b. We saw in the previous example that if we started at a, then the sequence is a b a b a where A has three occurrences and B has two. Another point to reinforce is that an odd number of terms represents an even number of bridges and vice versa. As we lay out the sequence for the journey for four bridges, we see that the frequency of A in the journey sequence is shown in the kth row and when N equals five, A occurs twice as opposed to three times in the previous example. Again, the number of letter i occurrences in the sequence is a function of the number of terms. The second dynamic that Euler noticed was a correspondence between the number of area letters in the sequence and the total number of bridges. Now we already noted the characteristic of the letter sequence where the number of letters in the sequence is essentially the number of bridges plus one, but we tie that together here in this slide more formally. We also introduce the next component of this concept to build it further. So where ki is the number of letter i occurrences in the bridge crossing sequence, the number of bridges plus one shown by b plus one is generally equal to the sum of the occurrence of the area letters in a sequence given by the sum of ki terms. This is shown below in figure five. I've used a table a little different to Euler's to show the various components of the bridge crossing sequence. Note the comments in red which highlight the key points in this slide. We see that the sum of the ki terms where i is a or b and the sum of their occurrences is the sequence which equals b plus 1. This is highlighted in the grey box above. There is also an adaptation of the function we introduced in the last couple of slides which shows the relationship between the number of letter occurrences in the sequence to the number of incident bridges on the letter area. This takes the relationship away from being anchored to the nth term of the sequence and ties it to the number of bridges so we don't have to calculate the sequence to identify the number of letter occurrences. Thirdly, Euler noticed that the correspondence of bridges to area letter occurrences in the sequence was different between journeys involving odd numbered bridges and those with an even number of bridges. Figure 6 shows the journeys that start at either A or B involving 5 bridges. Note that the sequences have 6 letters as well, therefore one more than the number of bridges involved. 
So no matter where you start, the number of letters in the journey sequence for an odd number of bridges will have an equal number of touch points in each area A and B. In this example, we see that both A and B have three occurrences. We also see that the sum of area letter occurrences in the overall journey sequence is equal to B plus 1, highlighted in the previous slides table. I've also highlighted the difference between even and odd number bridge dynamics in the grey box above with the light bulb. Although these examples are great ways to demonstrate the dynamics between even and odd numbered bridges in a journey, we'll now look at circumstances where there's a mix of odd and even numbered bridges incident on area letters. This is worked below in the animations in figure 7. In the first example in figure 7 we look at representation of the Koenigsberg problem which has a mix of even and odd numbered bridges. Mr. X will help us visualise the journey for the eight bridges. As he makes his way around, you can see the bridges he crosses turn red, indicating they can no longer be crossed in accordance with the rules of the problem. Just like the previous examples, the journey with eight bridges produces a nine letter journey sequence. As we lay out the journey information in the data table below, we see that the number of bridges incident on area letters is a mix of odd and even numbers. The sum of the incident bridges is 16, which is twice the number of bridges. The reason for this is that every bridge has two banks associated with it. Just like a handshake has two people associated with it, we see that the sum of the bridges incident on all area letters in the journey is equal to twice the number of bridges. This is shown below in the grey box with the light bulb. We see again that the sum of the area letter occurrences in the journey sequence is equal to the number of bridges plus one. Another interesting dynamic is discovered when we try to understand if it matters what area you start your journey from and if the number of bridges that are incident on it affects it. Here we see a journey as possible for a series of both even and odd numbered incident bridges under the Koenigsberg problem constraints, but it must start from an area letter with an odd number of incident bridges. To continue skirting around the Koenigsberg problem, let's consider another version of the problem in which we have six bridges instead of seven. The next example shows the dynamics of a problem with a homogeneous mix of areas with even numbers of incident bridges. That is, there are two bridges incident on each area A, B, and C. Mr. X will help us visualize the journey. Again, we see that the letter sequence is the number of bridges plus one, that the sum of the incident bridges is equal to two times the total number of bridges in the problem, and that the sum of the occurrences of letters in the letter sequence is equal to the number of bridges plus one. In this example, it doesn't matter where you start, a journey crossing each bridge once and only once is possible from an area with an even number of bridges. As the data table is fleshed out from the journey shown above, we see the rules emerge for a journey where all areas have an even number of incident bridges. Note the starting point has an additional instance in the journey sequence, and it's for this reason that the formula for starting points and other points are different. To finalize the examples that lead up to the Koenigsberg problem solution, We'll cover one more example in figure eight where all areas have an odd number of incident bridges. Since the Koenigsberg problem contains a varying number of incident bridges, but all incidents is odd, we can determine if a journey can be made using the characteristics we've covered in the animations leading up to this point, specifically those in figure six. Although Mr. X is away on task, if you try and find a journey for the diagram in figure eight, you'll see that the journey cannot be made. The number of incident bridges all add up to two times the total number of bridges, but the sum of the estimated occurrences required for a successful journey add up to more than B plus one. Therefore, the journey cannot be made. You can test this through enumeration of the possible permutations of journeys, but the point that Euler made was that enumeration is not an intelligent way to approach the problem. And as you may know, the possible number of permutations grow exponentially with the increasing number of elements in a set. The important deduction from this final example is that if more than two letters have an odd number of incident bridges, the journey cannot be made. We saw in figure seven previously that it had two areas with an odd number of incident bridges and a successful journey could be made. However, once you increase the number of areas with odd incidents past two, then the journey becomes impossible under the rules of the game. Finally, we get to the Koenigsberg problem itself. Based on the dynamics in the examples leading up to this, we can see that the problem has a homogeneous mix of areas with odd incidents. And leading on from the example we just covered, the sum of the occurrences of letters in the journey sequence is greater than B plus one, and thus the journey cannot be made. 
This is shown in red at the bottom of figure 8. Before we summarise the Konigsberg problem deductions, there's one circumstance which I purposely left until the end of the presentation, which Euler mentioned within the 1736 paper. It's quite ambiguous, but I think I know what Euler was thinking, but I must emphasise that this is only my own speculation and I can't confirm this. So there's a property of situations where all areas have even incidence, where the sum of the letter occurrences in the journey sequence is equal to, as Euler states, one less than the number of bridges plus one, which is essentially equal to the number of bridges. This is only possible if you apply the formulas we've already covered, but you'll still end up with a journey sequence which has B plus one letters. I think what Euler was stating was that this generates a property where the sum of letter occurrences in the sequence is equal to B, but at the end you have to add one letter occurrence for the area in which you started the journey, and ultimately you end up with B plus one occurrences of area letters in the journey sequence. It's a long-winded way of explaining what we've already covered, but anyone who's tried to read Shakespeare will know that 18th century literature is anything but concise. Euler summarises the three essential so-whats from his investigation into the solution of the Konigsberg problem, and they're given below. Firstly, if there are more than two areas in which an odd number of bridges lead, then such a journey is not possible. Secondly, if, however, the number of bridges is odd for exactly two areas, then the journey is possible if it starts in either of these areas. And if, finally, there are no areas to which an odd number of bridges leads, then the required journey can be accomplished starting from any area. This problem introduces the possibility of different kinds of routes characterised by the ability to repeat vertices and edges, essentially called walks, trails, paths and circuits, etc. In his closing comments, Euler also provides a rule of thumb for simplifying graphs to confirm a journey sequence which involves removing pairs of bridges that join the same two areas. These are also called parallel edges and we'll explore those later. Note the complete absence of set theory terminology in Euler's work. As I mentioned in the earlier slides of the Konigsberg problem, the set theory foundation wasn't available until almost 150 years later. George Cantor 1845 to 1918 is accredited with publishing the first article on set theory in 1874. Elements and connections, probability. In this example, the probability of drawing a card of a certain type of suit in a card deck is shown in example 11E. It can also be modeled using a unique type of graph called a tree. Trees aren't covered in this presentation, but are included in this section just to reinforce the various applications of graphs. In example 11E, you can see that the probability of drawing any type of card from a deck of cards is 1. If we discount the jokers, we see that the probability of drawing a specific suit is broken down into quarters. For example, you have a 25% chance of drawing a spade, as well as having a 25% chance of drawing any other suit. There are other applications of probability modelling for card games, but we won't cover those in this presentation. Elements and connections, causality. The final example of elements and connection we'll highlight is causality. In nonlinear systems modeling, directed edges, i.e. the lines and arrows, can be used to show a point exerting influence over another. That is an independent variable affecting a dependent variable. This application is limited though since the proportionality of influence, i.e. direct or inverse, is unable to be shown, only the fact that influence is exerted. Figure 11 shows a simple population growth and decay model from Sturman 2000's book called Business Dynamics. This example is then replicated with a specific type of graph called a directed graph in which the edges have an initiating point and a terminal point. Thus they have direction, much like a vector. A real world example of published work applying graph theory tools and techniques to nonlinear systems modeling is given by McGlashan et al. in 2016, which states, this research explores the application of network analytic methods as a new way to gain quantitative insight into the structure of an obesity causal loop diagram to inform intervention design. In this example, a directed graph like the one used in the previous example is used to represent the connection of causal factors in a network of interdependent variables. As we explored in the previous example, the type of proportionality is not presented only the fact that the points in the network influence each other. Example 11G shows an obesity causal loop diagram as a graph with in and out degrees. I didn't want to cover off on terminology here, just highlight the applications of graph theory to nonlinear feedback modeling. Rule of association. The final introduction we'll cover to graph components is the way in which a connection is mapped to a pair of elements which is given by a relation, specifically a function that maps a unique connection to a pair of endpoints. 
In graph theory, the rules are very simple. The problem is that these simple rules don't always generate products that correspond with reality or possess any utility, given they can vary in application to specific problems. For example, a graph can have no elements and thus no connections, essentially being a representation of nothing. And nothing is of no use to no one. Figure 13 shows the way the rule of association maps edges to endpoint pairs in graph theory compared to the way in which a function maps an element of the domain to an element in the codomain. Unlike a deterministic function that can map an element in the domain to a corresponding element in the codomain without any other information than an input, we cannot simply input a single point and have the function tell us exactly what points it is connected to and in what order, thus generating a graph from a single input. This is hinted to in studies of the value of characteristic polynomials that are derived from graph adjacency matrices, but doesn't work for graphs with five or more endpoints. Section Summary In this section we covered What a graph is and what a graph is not A general definition of a graph devoid of jargon where a graph is defined as a representation of elements and the connections between them, where the connections between elements are governed by a rule of association. We covered some key personalities in the field. Leibniz, the first person with the idea that a geometry without regard to measurement or magnitude could exist. Euler, the man who published the first known work on graph theory. Dennis Koenig, the man who wrote the first ever textbook on graph theory. And finally, a man called Oyston Orr, who we'll introduce here but cover in later presentations. We covered examples of elements and connections as well as an exploration in detail of the Konigsberg problem and the concept of geometry of precision introduced by Leibniz. Finally, we covered an example of the concept of the rule of association. A summary of the terms covered in this section are given below. Despite my best efforts, the paradoxical nature of trying to introduce concepts without introducing terms was challenging and I ultimately ended up introducing a number of terms. Two of these notable terms were loops, the self-referential edges which connect a vertex with itself, and a complete graph, which was shown in example 11c with the flock of eight social birds who all knew one another. That's all folks for part 1.1. Thanks for watching and if the presentation was of value to you, please do like and share. Stay tuned for part 1.2 where we'll explore graph components in detail. Mm -hmm.